This video is brought to you by Raycon True Wireless Earbuds. Stick around to hear more about them and also a special offer they're making available through my channel. All right, here's a shameful confession. I never played Dying Light 1. You wanna know why? Because around the same time it got released, Tom Clancy's The Division was running its beta tests and that was the game on which I would launch my YouTube career. Thank you, Mr. Clancy. So yeah, for like the next 18 months solid, all I played was The Division, which means that there's a large blackout period in my gaming knowledge and Dying Light falls squarely into that gap. I've heard very, very good things about it, and I'd always planned to jump into it at some point, but it never happened. And so when the sequel was unveiled some years later, I said to myself, there it is, that's my chance, not gonna miss the boat this time. I excitedly awaited the arrival of the title, eager to review it, only to then read that tweet from Techclan that was like, did you know you'll probably die of old age before finishing Dying Light 2? Okay, so they didn't quite say that, but they did say it would take like 500 hours to fully complete it and everyone kind of dunked on them and then they clarified that it was more like 80 hours to play through it, including side quests. And then they clarified further that the game is roughly 20 hours if you beeline the campaign, 80 hours with all side quests and 500 hours if you plan to do absolutely every single last thing in this video game. So I'm going to tell you right now that the 20 hours beeline line that is a lie. I mean, if you're one of those people at good games done quick that can finish Sekiro blindfolded in 90 minutes, then maybe you can do this in 20 hours. But for the rest of us, you're looking at a solid 35 to 40 hour playthrough with just your average detouring into the side content and the open world map stuff. This is a very, very meaty package. And while I do have some issues with the length and pacing, I think people are gonna be really satisfied with just how much is on offer here, how dense and worthwhile most of that is, and how much love and care has been put into every part of it. Often, particularly recently, AAA games can disappoint because of how cynical they feel, either in their goals, their structure, their monetization, or their over-promised under-delivering. I don't think there's much chance of that happening here in Dying Light 2 because it feels anything but cynical. The whole thing feels like this passion project where hundreds of people put it all on the line to deliver the best possible game they could for the $60 you paid. The lack of polish you might see in some parts is almost endearing because it reminds you that this isn't the output of some gigantic multi-billion dollar conglomerate. It's one studio self-publishing their game. Hell, this is an indie title if you apply a strict definition of the term. This team is punching well, well above their weight and they've made a game that I think most people will like and some people are going to absolutely love. I fall into the like category. Dying Light 2 offers up one of the most compelling gameplay loops I've ever experienced in an open world game. The parkour in this game is fucking incredible. It is astoundingly good, and it only gets better and better as you play more of the game, unlocking new abilities and accessing new parts of the city. The tension inherent in this game's day-night cycle has the power to completely flip your experience in seconds if you are not paying attention to that setting sun. The mission design is often superb, delivering set-piece moments that I still vividly remember and I expect to remember for a long time to come. There's just so much here to admire, and I really do. Like, I admire what Techland have done with these things because they are genuinely that good. But in a weird way, Dying Light 2 also kind of showed me how far the bar for this type of game has been raised this past generation. Dying Light 2 is a very story-driven, character-driven game, and in those areas, the game really flops hard. The lead character isn't properly built up or fleshed out. It's very difficult to connect with him and his motivations. The characters that you meet are all full of personality, but in a really awkward, overplayed sense. They're none of them real people. They're all puppets that say and do human things, but never come across as remotely human. Most of them all look kind of weird as well, and given how much time is spent talking to people in this game, the inconsistent facial animations and lip syncing is a bit of a gut punch to the dramatic stakes this game is trying to build. Plot-wise, it's a mess, and it only gets messier as it goes on. Many of the pacing issues that this game eventually suffers from are due in large part to the fact that Techland just didn't seem to know how they wanted to wrap up this 40-hour epic. Running around Dying Light 2 City can feel almost as good as it does to web-sling as Peter Parker in Insomniac's Spider-Man game, but the gulf between the storytelling and presentation chops of those two games is so vast. And that's what I mean when I say that Dying Light 2 reminds us just how high that AAA bar now is. This is a great game on so many fronts, but it's not a great game on all fronts. And combined with some generic open world design elements and some worrying technical issues, there's a chance you're gonna bump into something here that's gonna make you bounce off the title. But if you click with this, then you're probably gonna click with it really hard because its best parts are that good that they are more than capable of hard carrying the rest of this experience.
Okay, so let's talk performance bugs and visual presentation first. I tested Dying Light 2 on an RTX 2080 Ti with an AMD Ryzen 7 3700X. That's a strong PC by most metrics, but far from the top of the line. It will generally run stuff at max settings 1440p, but will struggle with native 4K. The full breakdown of how Dying Light 2 runs is complex because there's a lot of ways to run it and some key settings that have a drastic impact on performance. So just to be very clear at a top level, on PC, I found this ran very well for me when I used the right settings. I think it looked great and it was extremely stable. I had only one crash during my entire playthrough. So top level, for me at least, it's a really good news story from a performance and stability perspective. However, I will flag that there were quite a few concerns around console stability, some game breaking bugs, and the absence of Nvidia DLSS during the review window. And most importantly, the absence of co-op during the review window. That was quite concerning to be honest, so I'll talk more about that later. So, how does my RTX 2080 Ti machine handle this? Well, if 4K gaming is your goal, then you can do it with the assistance of stuff like AMD FSR upscaling. Again, I couldn't test Nvidia DLSS. Running native 4K, I was averaging around 30 FPS, so pretty shit. But turning on that upscale support, I was able to hit an average of around 55 to 60 frames on high settings with ray tracing turned off. So that's a very impressive testament to the power of those upscaling tools, given that you give up very little graphical fidelity for what is a huge performance increase. On this machine, running at 4K, any ray tracing is impossible. Even with those upscaling tools turned on, I was sitting at between 20 to 30 FPS with a lot of fluctuation occurring. So bottom line, the 2080 Ti is still a really strong card today, and it can hit 4K, but not without some help and not with ray tracing. 1440p is where I found my sweet spot though. That runs at around 60 FPS on high settings, no upscale assistance, ray tracing turned off. Turning on the upscaling got me to around 85 FPS and it felt extremely smooth. I was really happy here and I actually played through most of the game at these settings. If I turned ray tracing on at 1440p, even with upscaling, things would fall apart and they'd quickly drop down to like 30 to 40 FPS, again, a lot of fluctuation. Interestingly enough, even when I dropped down to 1080p, upscaling on, ray tracing on, I was still only getting around 50 to 60 FPS. It was playable, but far from ideal given the frame drops I was getting. So I think the key takeaway here is that unless you are running a 30 series graphics card, you can essentially kiss ray tracing goodbye. The good news is that I found the game to be extremely stable. When I arrived at the right settings, I would almost never get any frame fluctuations. It was just locked regardless of if I was fighting a dozen zombies or staring across a vast city vista. It was just so reliable. And I love that because most AAA games, especially ones as ambitious as this, don't behave like that on day one or even on day 100. Client stability was also top tier. I had only one crash during my entire playthrough. That's pretty rad. Most games this big and ambitious crash a lot more than that. So yeah, thanks Techland. When it comes to the PC port, I think the overall takeaway is that this game is pretty well built, pretty well optimized. I had a lot of room in the settings to squeeze out more frames if I wanted to, and the range of settings gave me the room to find the right configuration for me. No matter what your rig is, I expect you'll find a mixture of settings that gets this running well for you. Given how dense and demanding this game is, I really think that Techland should be congratulated for a PC version that is this flexible and functional. As always, those are my impressions on my hardware, your mileage may vary greatly. There is a different conversation to be had around bugs. Now, to be clear, I had very few bugs when I was playing. None worth mentioning here, to be honest with you. It was very solid. However, I am aware that there were a number of bugs on console, some of which would lead to regular crashes. This was apparently fixed in the review period, but even then I spoke to other reviewers who were still getting crashes post patch. If you're planning on playing through this game on a console, then be sure to find a console review of the game first and get their take on how stable this thing is. In addition to that, there were a number of gameplay affecting bugs that other reviewers bumped into, one of which was so severe that it actually bricked a number of people's save files. That was also apparently fixed in the review period, but I also can't personally confirm that that issue is 100% resolved. Finally, I just heard from a few reviewers that the game was fairly buggy for them, which tells me that perhaps I got lucky in my playthrough. The big issue though, and the big red flag for me was co-op. There was no co-op available during the review period, 
It was enabled in the last few hours of the review window, which means that I was not able to test it. The fact that it arrived so late tells me that it was probably coming in hot, and I wonder if there were problems with it. If you're planning on playing this co-op, then it might be wise to hold off on this one until you get confirmation from a few sources that co-op actually works. Sadly, I cannot give you that today. So while the game does run beautifully and is stable on PC, the absence of core features like Nvidia DLSS and co-op during the review period, the reports of poor console stability and the potentially game-breaking bugs do stop me from giving this one the big high five that I'm sure many people were hoping for. There are just too many outstanding question marks at the moment, so if you have the patience, I do recommend waiting a few days for some more details to become available. That way you'll know exactly what you'll be getting when you slap down that $60 asking price. Visually, Dying Light 2 is an extremely impressive package most of the time. In its opening tutorial section, I was immediately knocked over by the scope and beauty of its outdoor landscapes. Technically, they're not dissimilar from what you saw in the recent Far Cry 6, for example, but stylistically, they're just so much richer and more beautiful and more alive. The gentle sway of the vegetation, the way the sunlight spills over and through the tree lining, the way that internal spaces were warmed by that sunset glow. Dying Light 2 isn't impressive only for its detail and draw distances, it's impressive for how much work has clearly gone into creating and finessing each landscape or building each room. This is a title that's been in development for six years and you can absolutely see how much time and effort the environment artists have put into each of the spaces they've created. And this was just the opening section, I hadn't even arrived at the city yet and that's a whole other layer of impressive. You're immediately directed to the safety of a rooftop and from there you can begin to survey your surroundings. It's crazy not only how far you can see, but how much environmental detail is retained when you're doing that. It doesn't look scaled down to accommodate the impressive draw distances. It retains almost everything, so the process of gazing out across the cityscape becomes that much more immersive because Dying Light 2 isn't functioning like most video games function. The world seems so much more real when you can still see its details from a great distance. And I don't know exactly how Techland pulled this off, but it's such an impactful technical and design choice. Some of my best memories of Dying Light 2 are those brief moments of respite on a rooftop where I can take a break, collect myself, and just enjoy the view. Up close, the locations of Dying Light 2 are equally impressive. Just as in the opening tutorial, every room you step into is dripping with bespoke detailing that doesn't happen by accident. This is possible because the world map of Dying Light 2 isn't that large. It's just the right size to allow for a feeling of scale without being so large that it becomes impossible for the artist to make each part of it feel distinct. That's not to say that there aren't copy and pasted locations, because there absolutely are, but you forgive those given how much density and detail exists across the world more broadly. There is genuine satisfaction to be had in discovering a new location because not only will that likely propel the story forward, but it's almost always going to give you an interesting new space that you can look at and soak up all of its finery. If there's one criticism to be leveled at Dying Light 2's visual presentation, it's gotta be character models, which are really inconsistent. Some of them can look really good, actually, with realistic looking facial detailing and lip sync and animations that make them look like believable characters. Some of them, though, look really weird and kind of waxy and like those animatronic puppets. Their faces, the way they move when they talk, their awkward facial expressions. It's all just really off-putting, and given the fact that most of the conversations in this game are pretty serious, I did find that those character models really took me out of those scenes. That's a minor gripe when set against what is, I think, a really impressive package both technically and stylistically. Dying Light 2 runs beautifully, it's stable, at least on PC, it marries infinite horizons with intricately detailed interiors, and the combination of all this is an experience that feels so immersive. That's where Dying Light 2 really shines overall, I think, immersion. And just as the technical foundation of the game facilitates that, so does the open world design and gameplay. It would be easy to advance the argument that Dying Light 2 is essentially just Far Cry with parkour, or first person Assassin's Creed, but set in the modern day. Point is, you could argue it's a Ubisoft game with a different coat of paint, and that is rarely a polite comparison. 
Ubisoft's open world design was a hallmark of the past console generation, as it served up a template that many, many games were ready to adopt. As a result, the template became a little too ubiquitous about halfway through the last console generation, and by the end of that generation, we are all pretty agreed that we were ready for something else. I do think it's important to remember, though, that what goes into a template is far more important than the template itself. I mean, the Spider-Man games were full of copy and pasted open world activities labeled with map markers, but everyone loves Spider-Man. Same goes for Ghosts of Tsushima, which pretty much everyone agrees was just Assassin's Creed in Japan, but it ruled because the storytelling, the world, the combat, the visual design, the soundtrack, it was all just top notch. A template does not make it the game, and I think that's very much the case here in Dying Light 2. Dying Light 2 is an open world action RPG. There is a storyline that will shuttle you from mission to mission, place to place, cutscene to cutscene. That plays out in the fictional city of Villador, one part a low-rise residential area full of European-style terraces, and the other a ruined cityscape full of towering high-rises. Within these two halves are a number of districts which lack either power or water, and as you progress through the story, you'll be able to access the missions that will allow you to restore these vital utilities. Reviving those districts and filling them with new safe house locations, new fast travel points, new vendors, and new quest givers. You will spend a lot of time capturing and unlocking stuff in this game. There are windmills, which are sort of like a traversal challenge, and reaching the top grants you a safe house and new vendors. There are actual safe houses to capture and restore, each of which grants you a crusty mattress on which to rest your head, as well as access to a shared storage locker, which you probably won't use during your whole playthrough, at least I didn't. There are metro stations that function as fast travel points. There are bandit camps, abandoned supply convoys, and tons of other open world stuff. All the open worldy things that you can capture or claim in other games, there is essentially an equivalent of that here in Dying Light 2. But Dying Light 2 is not defined by this capture and claim gameplay loop. It's a very optional part of the experience, generally speaking. It is possible to ignore basically all of this stuff, and you'll still have an amazing time with this game. There is a little bit of level gating that kicks in at some point, but so long as you're doing some of the side content and unlocking some of the landmarks, you're not going to find yourself in a situation where you have to do a whole bunch of open world bullshit just so you can continue to progress the story. Having said that, I really enjoyed almost all the open world stuff that I was doing. The traversal challenges were clever and fun, the hunt for paths up to the lofty safe houses was always interesting, the puzzle inherent in clearing out a supply zone riddled with zombies was a testament to how clever and flexible this game's combat system is. Just as an example, clearing out the metros was a real highlight. You have to go there during the night, otherwise they're too infested with zombies. So you wait till nightfall and you go in there and there's still plenty of zombies there asleep. So you can kill them if you like, but it's probably better to sneak past them. So you're like really stressed out when this is going on because if you wake one of them up, they're all gonna wake up and then it's on like Donkey Kong. Regardless of how you progress, you'll eventually get to the end where you need to power up a generator. And that's a traversal challenge where there are different circuits and they're hidden in this underground basement area and sometimes that's filled with chemicals so you're on this timer and you're even more stressed out when you finally get that done you feel so much relief and you really feel like you've accomplished something you know the flip side to that story are the more tired open world design tropes that rob this world of the sense of exploration that it could have engendered were it designed differently for example, you have to do that pinging the environment thing wherever you go, where you hold down the R3 button and then all of the items around you light up and you get wall hacks. Uh, yeah, I almost always hate this and I especially hate it here because it's essentially impossible to play this game without constantly spamming it. None of the environments are designed to be passed with your eyes. You need the assistance of this ping system to see anything and that immediately erodes the sense of exploration and discovery in internal spaces. A similar issue exists at the macro level when it comes to finding new locations. The central mechanic driving this is a set of binoculars which in theory allow you to see stuff in the distance and mark it on your map. But really it's just wiping the cursor across the screen until the reticle gets smaller and your controller vibrates. You can see through things and mark stuff you can't even see so long as your controller is rumbling enough. You can fill up the entire map with map markers, highlighting stuff you've never even laid eyes on yet. It's just so gamey. 
Better to have had nothing like this at all and force people to walk around the city discovering stuff. Because yeah, that sense of exploration is definitely not a feature of Dying Light 2's world and that's a real shame. Even despite this absence, I would say that Dying Light 2's open world design isn't defined by its originality, but by how much effort has gone into making each of these familiar activities and objectives feel worth your time, feel interesting, feel rewarding. There is some drop off that starts to kick in after a while because yeah, you do reach a point where you've seen and done it all before. But I hit that point far, far later than I have in many open world games. And while I think a big chunk of that is because of how well designed these open world activities are, a big part of it is just the fact that Dying Light 2 is really, really fun to play. <laughs> Earlier I mentioned that Dying Light 2 really nails a sense of immersion and I think that really comes through in its world, its combat and its parkour. When I say world, I don't mean the open world stuff I just talked about. I mean the tension inherent in this city. The way that a thin sheet of plywood is often all that separates the surviving humans from the zombie hordes outside. The way the zombies themselves will often hibernate during the day, making indoors really perilous, but at night they spill out onto the streets, so indoor areas suddenly transform into a sort of safe zone. You start to conceive of Villador as a sort of ocean that you can safely sail across so long as you stay high enough above the waterline, but at times you're forced to descend below. A difference of just 10 or 12 feet will completely transform how comfortable, relaxed and secure you feel. You might just be sailing along the rooftops, jumping from vent to antenna to rickety bridge, and as you misjudge a jump and come tumbling down to the pavement below, you immediately just kind of snap into survival mode. You look around, you take stock of your surroundings, you do a scan for threats, you desperately search for a pathway back up to the safety of the rooftops. And while that safety is rarely far away, that few seconds of panic will keep your blood pumping in a way that few open world games are able to do. I can't think of a game that has a more impactful day-night cycle than this one. There are two cities here, the one that exists in the day and the one that comes out at night. Choosing to brave the darkness and raid old department stores for supplies when the zombies are out to feed, that decision to be in that darkness is such a meaty decision and it never loses any of its significance from the first moment you play this game to the minute the credits roll. You are always thinking about this, always planning your routes and asking yourself, should I wait for sunrise first or should I go now? When you plan to venture into that good night, you are looking at your map first and asking, if shit goes wrong, where can I run to safety? You're keeping that destination in the back of your head every second because if any one of those howlers see you and a chase starts, you better have your escape route clearly mapped out or you are screwed. Quick, they almost got us. Don't look back, run! That day-night cycle and how differently the world behaves based on when you are in it, that is an incredibly immersive characteristics. Few open world games feel like they have a flow or a rhythm that you need to observe or adhere to. They're typically quite static. Few open world games have the potential to transform themselves so suddenly. The closest comparison I can think of is like having a 5 star wanted rating in GTA. That's what nighttime feels like here. Daytime is just CJ cruising around on his bike living the dream and nighttime is tanks and helicopters chasing you down while you try and escape in a stolen station wagon. I really really love what Techland have built here. In addition to that, I was really impressed by how well combat worked in this game and again how immersive that felt. This is a world where there are no bullets left, so everyone's just carrying around jury-rigged melee weapons like the leg of a chair or a pipe with some disc brakes fashioned to it, and everyone's just running up to each other and swinging. When I first saw this first-person melee combat, I got flashbacks of Skyrim or whatever, where you just kind of swing your weapon stupidly and then stuff dies. It's not like that here. Yeah, you do swing a lot of the time, but the locomotion of your character, the way enemies move and the hit registration, it's all excellent. So too is the feedback you get when you connect. Everything from the vibration of your controller to the sound of bones breaking, to the way enemies buckle and ragdoll, to the spraying of blood when you sever a limb. 
it all feels so satisfying and so impactful. Then there's the more technical elements of combat, like the parry window, which staggers enemies and opens them up to parkour attacks. These typically involve you using your staggered foe as a springboard and then driving both feet into some unlucky dude's ribcage. There are additional moves that open up later, like a ground slam and some more ways to stagger enemies, but all of it feels pretty grounded. Techland have really landed on a first-person melee combat model that feels like it has options, and those options feel connected to the beating heart of Dying Light 2's gameplay, the parkour. Okay, so the parkour, I'm gonna say this right now. If you aren't really vibing this game, you should still pick it up at some point just to experience this parkour. It's amazing, and it only gets more amazing the more you play. I was laughing aloud sometimes because of what I was doing and how good it felt to do it. Like, do you know the game will actually dynamically score your parkour? So if you really get going and start chaining together a whole bunch of moves, then the music will build and your character Aiden will start talking to himself because he's feeling really pumped up. It's, it's awesome. I know I've spoken about Ubisoft a lot in this video already, but there's a lot of parallels between this game and a Ubisoft game. Parkour is one of them. Assassin's Creed was really the only parkour based game for a long time and that was really cool because you actually had to navigate the environment. You had to look where you were running and find the right handholds or ledges or poles to swing on or whatever. That was entirely removed in the new Assassin's Creed games. You could just press forward and you'll climb over anything, including just sheer walls with no handholds whatsoever. Ridiculous. Dying Light 2 shows us where Assassin's Creed could have taken things had they invested in a parkour system rather than abandoning it. The sense of speed and flow that this parkour system engenders is so addictive. Like, I'm done playing Dying Light 2. I don't want to play any more of its side quests or clear more map markers. But I really want to keep doing the parkour because honestly, it's it's like hard to imagine how it could be much better. Like, where do you go from here? That's actually a question I asked at the beginning of the game when I had no tools or upgrades at my disposal. But later on, you'll unlock really meaningful parkour upgrades that will allow you so much more freedom and expression without things ever becoming ridiculous. It's not like you have rocket boots or whatever. Most of it, like the combat, is pretty grounded, protecting the sense of immersion that's so core to this experience. I have to shout out the level design here. What you can do as a character is only half of the parkour equation. The other half is the levels that you are running through and over. And man, this is top tier level design. You'll spend at least half of the game in the low rises of Old Villador, and that is already so impressive. I mean, the world has been designed for you to run and jump all over, but it feels like an authentic, lived-in space. Even though all of its buildings and vents and power lines look real, so seamless is your movement through this space that it almost feels like these things are reaching out to catch you when you fall. It was hard to imagine how that could have got better, but then you get to the city, and that just completely changes everything. The paraglider you get there allows you to move up and down these vast heights with the assistance of air vents. There are also these pulley systems on the ground that will immediately rocket you to the top of a skyscraper. Sometimes there's neither an air vent or a pulley system, and you need to duck and weave in and outside an 80-story skyscraper as you search for a way to the top. A whole new set of challenges, puzzles, and thrills become available to you, supported by that paraglider, but more because of the fantastic level design. Arriving at that city center was a true highlight, because I had no idea how much Techland was still holding in reserve when I was already 20 hours deep into this game. Why are you looking for Waltz, Milgram? I have to at least know if she's alive. No weapon on your radio. Come on, let's go. I spent a lot of time praising what I think are many of Dying Light 2's most essential elements, world design, combat, parkour, but there's one more essential element, and that one really pales in comparison to the rest of the game. It's the story and characters. You might say, well, that stuff doesn't really matter that much in an open world zombie parkour game. And yeah, I can totally see that. I think many people will still really love this game despite how much it fails to deliver on the story front. The story really matters to me personally, especially when your game is at least 40 hours worth of story. Like if this was Risk of Rain, which I played for 50 plus hours, I don't care about the story because the game is not putting that in front of me. It's about the combat. Dying Light 2 is absolutely putting 40 hours worth of story and cutscenes and dialogue and characters and side quests in front of you, and unfortunately very little of it is good. So you play as Aiden, a dude who's just arrived in town looking for his missing sister, and very quickly you get wrapped up in a big mess involving the rival factions of Villador, namely the independent survivors and the more militant peacekeepers who've took it upon themselves to police Villador, even though no one's asked them to. 
Based on that description alone, you can immediately guess most of the important story beats that this game offers up. Meeting low-level people who will introduce you to high-level faction leaders, who will ask you to run errands to earn their trust, who then send you on missions to do things, and then, oh, they betrayed you, or they got betrayed by someone else, so on and so forth. It's very run-of-the-mill, post-apocalypse, humanity is the real threat kind of stuff, and if you've experienced any sort of zombie apocalypse media in the past, you will have seen absolutely all of this. This could have been salvaged were there some characters that were worth getting to know, or at least worth watching, but that is not the case either. As I said earlier, Dying Light 2's characters are either bland archetypes or overplayed caricatures. It's not possible to connect with any of them because none of them feel remotely real. That includes Aiden, by the way, who is just not a compelling character. He's a bit of a blank canvas in the sense that you'll guide his more important decisions, but even outside of that, he just lacks a quality that makes you want to hear his contribution to a conversation. He's just there to kind of drag exposition out of other characters more than anything else. One of the big successes of this game's narrative is how meaningful your choices are and how many choices you have. At many points throughout both side quests and the main story, I was presented with really meaty decisions that would greatly impact my playthrough. I'm talking stuff like which faction I want to control the city, whether or not I'll betray a faction leader, whether I'll rescue my friend versus completing the mission. These decisions are real decisions with significant consequences both during your playthrough and in determining the final ending you'll unlock, which I'm told there are quite a few of those, I only got one of them of course. But even that was not enough to save what I think is a real mess from a plot and character perspective. I was never engaged in this story, and I was okay with that because the gameplay was so good. But at around the 25 hour mark, the game has no more new things to show you, and that's when things really started to go off the rails for me. That's when I struggled to stay engaged. You absolutely could have shaved at least 10 hours off this main storyline, and the game would have been better for it, because it would have meant that you were getting both narrative and gameplay reveals right the way through. Unfortunately, there is a solid 10 to 15 hours where the game just kind of meanders towards an awkward finish. I don't think Techland knew where they wanted to land this one. Something went wrong in the narrative department that absolutely did not go wrong in almost any other part of the game. And that's a shame given how front and center this narrative is during the entire experience. So let's recap. Dying Light 2 is a cool video game. There are plenty of technical question marks still out there, which is a big deal to be honest. Definitely stops me from suggesting you rush out and buy this one right now. There's an open world structure here that I think most people are going to find familiar, but few people will think is lazy. Much like the rest of the game, you can tell that Techland have really gone all in to deliver experiences that are worth your time. These open world elements aren't hugely original, but they are very well done. Where the game really shines is in how deep and immersive its core systems are. It's day-night cycle driven world, it's weighty, flexible combat, and it's utterly superb parkour system. A system that is so good that it's almost worth playing this game just to experience it. Narratively, it sucks, unfortunately. And while I don't think it's going to be a killing blow for many, it's going to be a killing blow for some, and it kind of was for me in some ways. My overall enjoyment of this experience was greatly undermined by having to sit through 40 hours of badly written story and characters. But despite that, this is a really easy recommend to most people, particularly those who might want to play co-op if the co-op works. I can imagine that my overall appreciation for this experience would have been greatly elevated were I doing it alongside a friend. The thrill of racing each other across the rooftops, that alone would have been awesome to do for 40 hours. Sadly, I didn't get that opportunity, but I hope everybody else does when the game goes live. More than anything else, I would say that I really admire this product and the work that Techland have put into it. Like I said, this is an indie studio, technically speaking. They worked for six years on this. It's a $60 asking price for a massive game where it feels like no corners were cut, no expense was spared, and where every effort was made to deliver something that fans would appreciate. I really appreciate that. And while the overall experience didn't click for me, as much as I expect it will click with many, I'm definitely going to be singing this game's praises for a long time to come because I think there's just so much here to enjoy. So yeah, Dying Light 2, I recommend it. New year, new you, huh? I do joke about it, but I am legitimately, unironically, trying to dig myself out of the fitness hole that four months in quarantine landed me in. And while I'm doing that, my Raycon wireless earbuds are an essential part of my workout kit. Whether walking, running, or benching 100 kilos, that's a lie, I can't bench anywhere near that at the moment. Raycon wireless earbuds let you experience wireless audio wherever you go without having to fork out the price tag you typically pay for that experience. 
Raycons are literally half the price of other earbuds you've heard about, but the quality is just as good and the battery life goes the distance as well. Raycons newest model, the Everyday Earbuds, are their best ones yet, with 32 hours of battery life, 8 hours of playtime, a built-in microphone for phone calls, seamless Bluetooth pairing, more bass, 5 different color options, and a range of custom gel tips for both comfort and to ensure a nice noise isolating fit. These things really stay in, for real. You could be doing the whole headbanging thing and your Raycons would just stay in your ears. Just be careful when you do this though, it's not good for your neck. Raycons have over 45,000 five-star reviews and best of all, Raycons come with free shipping and a 45-day return policy so you don't have to take my word for it. Just try them for yourself and if you're unhappy, you can just get your money back. Super easy. To get 15% off your order, visit buyraycon.com forward slash skill up or just click the link in the description below. Thanks Raycon for sponsoring the video and thank you for watching it.